Good morning, everybody. Uh, nice to see you uh, again, those of you who were um, here yesterday. Um, I think you've heard everything you could possibly hear from me. But today I'm going to talk about a different topic than the one I covered yesterday. Today I'm going to talk about a topic that is very dear to my heart. And it is a topic of ethics. Ethics in education, ethics in technology and education. Yesterday, I spoke to you about all the wonderful things that we can do with technology in education. Today, I'm going to talk to you about all the horrible things that we can do with technology and education, but we're not careful enough. I'm going to tell you about some of the things that have gone wrong, mostly in the United States, which is where I work, and where I practice my profession. There will be some cases outside of the United States. I would argue that some of these cases are also applicable to Colombia and other countries because just because we made the mistakes first, it does not mean that you will not make the same mistakes because to err is human and to err twice is also human. So what is the objective for this session this morning? Um, I believe that as, education, as educators and technologists, we have an obligation, both legal in some cases, but also moral, uh, to protect the information of our students. Uh, we, have, we know a lot about them, we have a lot of information about them, and sometimes we're not very careful with that information. And this is one of the things that we need to do much better. In the United States and in Europe, every day, there are new examples in the newspapers of corporations that have lost student information. Guess what? More often than not, the universities are not equally reported. But almost every university in the United States, and there are about 5,000 of them, almost everyone have lost student data, important data. Data that can be used for many reasons, including something that is really, really bad for students, which is identity theft. Because of the data we've lost, birth dates, names, addresses, social security numbers, many of our students have been exposed to harassment and inconvenience in their lives. Some have even lost job opportunities because when their identities were stolen, their credit histories were damaged, and then they could not get jobs until they could clear those histories. Did we, do this? did we do this on purpose? More often than not, we didn't. Nobody's trying to hurt the students. We just did this because we're incompetent. 5,000 universities in the United States are incompetent when it's time to take care of a student information. There are many other things that have gone wrong in universities in the United States. Uh, problems with information security and privacy, as I mentioned, with intellectual property, and also with data protection. So I plan to discuss um, these cases, and I plan to give you some ideas about um, how to avoid um, the problems that we have encountered ourselves. But once again, the purpose for all my sessions is the same. You may recall this from yesterday. Think. That's it, Paul. Start thinking in a different way. Think about the uh, new things that you can do. So I went through uh, my bio yesterday, but here I want to emphasize something different. At the very bottom, you see a number of initials. Of those, the most important ones for that talk are one, Certified Information Systems Security Professional. That means that in addition to what I've studied, practiced, and written, I've taken a specific exam to demonstrate that I'm an expert in information security. The other one is Certified Information Privacy Professional. Same thing, in addition to my writings, my study, I have demonstrated through a third party exam that I'm an expert in uh, privacy. There's also something that uh, helps me qualify here, which is once again this organization on which I serve, which is the Electronic Privacy Information Center. One of the premier organizations in the world protecting the rights of all consumers, all citizens all over the world, including students. So for example, one of the recent things that we did, we sued a lawsuit, we sued the Department of Education in the United States 
because we believe that they were changing the laws in which that were going to be damaging to the privacy of students. There are strong privacy regulations in the United States, even though the universities don't follow them very well, and the United States Department of Education was trying to relax them, so we sued them. We lost, by the way, but at least we tried. So. And I sued not only because I'm a member of the organization, but also because having studied my master's degree and my doctoral degree in the United States, the Department of Education has information about me, and so do the universities, and I was trying to protect my own information from being linked to third-party companies for marketing and other purposes. So there's a connection between uh, law and uh, technology. And uh, this is my favorite quote. This is a legal opinion from the um, Third Circuit Court of Appeals in the United States. And there was a case in which there was a prisoner that was eligible for parole to have a hearing where he could get out of jail. And the lawyer for the prisoner, using the electronic system, had to submit a document with a given deadline. And in choosing the document from the list of documents, the lawyer chose the wrong document, filed the wrong document. Have you ever made a mistake sending an attachment? Have you ever sent the wrong attachment? Raise your hand. This is what the lawyer did. And the government lawyer said, oh, too bad. You missed your chance. Come back in two years for the next parole. So they appealed all the way to the Third Circuit. And the lawyer, the judge in the circuit wrote this opinion said, no, no, you have to give the lawyer and the prisoner another chance. Everybody can make a mistake. In fact, as he wrote, a computer lets you make more mistakes faster than any invention in human history, with the possible exceptions of handguns and tequila. I think he's right. So I think that part of the problem that we encounter when it comes to using technologies and using them in a moral and legal way and all the abuses and things that can go wrong with them is through what I call Molina's cycle of innovation and regulation. This is Molina. I made that up. I created that. So in this cycle, it's very simple. At first, we have the technologists and the scientists coming up with new ideas and new technologies. Then we have the business people and the entrepreneurs figuring out how can we make this into products and services that we can sell. How can we get people to buy or adopt these technologies. Over time, the bad guys come. And the bad guys who are the criminals, the cyber criminals, but also some of the people in the corporations who think without morals and say, listen, I can take all the data and resell it even though I don't have permission and make money. Those people start abusing the technology. And once those technologies are being abused, what happens? Well, usually law enforcement and the legal system prosecute and curtail those abuses. And eventually they will realize that the existing laws and procedures do not work with the new technologies. So the legislators will have to pass new laws. The data protection laws, the transparency laws, the open government laws, laws that are supposed to help us, in theory, get the best from the technologies and avoid the problems that the abusers are creating with the technologies. And what is the problem in this particular cycle? Take a guess, how long does it take from the time a new technology appears until new laws about that technology appear and are enforced? Take a guess, anybody. How long? Six months? Six years? Even longer. And what happens? By the time the laws come up, the technologies have changed so much that the laws are not even applicable. And in the meantime, the bad guys are always finding new ways to trick the system, to get the information, to make money, because there's money to be made. And you know, if you're a bad guy, you want to make money in a bad way. This is what you do. So in this interesting cycle, I always find that the technologies, the scientists, and the business people are on that side of the chart. And on this side, we always have the lawyers and the criminals. I don't think it's a coincidence that we always have the lawyers and the criminals together. So. So one of the big things that we find in education, something that should worry us, something that your colleagues spoke about yesterday, about the students oversharing, is the problem with privacy. And privacy 
has many different dimensions to it. For example, most countries did not have any privacy legislation up until a few years ago. In fact, nowhere in the Constitution of the United States can you read the word privacy. It was in an article in 1890 that two law professors from Harvard and justices came up with an article about privacy. And they deducted, they deduced that privacy was coming from the Constitution from the Fourth Amendment in the United States. The Fourth Amendment is the amendment against unreasonable search and seizure. And it was an <coughs> amendment that the Americans put in there because the British, who were dominating them, used to go into every house and look through everything, looking for potential you know, anti-government documents or activities or things like that. And they passed in the Constitution, the government has no right to have an unreasonable search and seizure. They cannot search you any time unless they have a reason to do so. So from there we evolved the concept of privacy. And there are two big types of privacy. One of them is decisional privacy, and the other one is informational privacy. The informational privacy we understand very well. It's the one that says, listen, you have information about me. What are you going to do about that information? I want to control that information. So for example, how many of you read the privacy policies of the websites that you use? Nobody. Why? Because even I, I am an expert and I cannot read them. These things take forever. It would take me months to read the policies. And then even if I read them, even if I read the policy for Facebook, how many of you use Facebook? So imagine you read the policy of Facebook and you don't like it. Are you going to stop using Facebook? Really? You're not going to get along with your people. You're not going to find out what's going on with your friends. So you're stuck there. Same thing, how many of you use Gmail, for example, from Google? What happens if you don't like the privacy policy from Google? Too bad. You complain, like we complain at Epic and other places. We ask the government to investigate, but in the meantime, we continue to use those applications. So information privacy is even more important when it comes to educational records. For example, I have my doctoral degree from Georgetown, and I have very good grades. I'm very proud of that. You can check my grades and everything else. I also have done my training as a sailing captain or a scuba diver. Very happy of the results. Yet I was expelled twice from the Northern Virginia Community College. Twice. They kicked me out of the school. I was taking a motorcycle riding classes. And one day I had to leave early. And the other day I arrived late. And I was expelled twice. I don't want the world to know this. Well, you probably know already. but. I don't want the world to know this. I don't want, when I'm applying for a job, that people can look my, at my name on the internet and say, yeah, Pablo's got his doctoral degree and everything else. What's up with this? He was expelled twice from the Northern Virginia Community College. And furthermore, because I have no control of that information, what if it says that I have been expelled and it doesn't explain that I was expelled because I was late to a motorcycle class, as opposed to being expelled for bad behavior or unable to follow the academic standards? Those are some of the reasons why we control our information and privacy. We also want to control information and privacy with anything that has to do with health. If you go to the doctor, you don't want people other than your doctor and other people you designate to know about your medical conditions. You know, if you've got depression, that's bad enough. But you don't want the entire neighborhood, your colleagues. If a student has depression and has taken some time off from class and has consulted with the academic counselors, then that should be kept private. Guess what? In some schools, it was not kept private and created problems for the students further along in their careers and their lives. There's also the decision of privacy. The decision of privacy is something that I use with the following example. I hired a network engineer from Venezuela to work for me at Georgetown University in the technology department. And when I was interviewing him via Skype, I said, listen, you have great credentials, certification from Cisco, engineering degree experience, and you work for Honeywell, which is a great company in Venezuela. Why would you come to the United States? And then he told me, well, I'm going to be very straightforward with you. We had a referendum for Chavez. And you could vote freely whether you wanted Chavez to continue in power or not. And I voted freely. And I said, I don't want Chavez to continue in power. And then the government kept 
a database of everybody with the identity number and how they voted. And every time Honeywell was asked to provide workers like me for the petroleum, the oil industry in Venezuela to do work, they would look at the list of numbers. And if anybody voted no, you were not welcome in the project. So I haven't been able to work. Honeywell is still paying me a salary, but this is not going to continue because I can't do any work for them. That is institutional privacy. The ability to make your own decisions because nobody's going to interfere with them. And decisional privacy is also very important on the internet. And it's important that we protect that for the students. If, for example, let's say we're not feeling well, but we're not ready to go to the psychiatrist or the psychologist. We may feel, I'm not sure if I got the blues, I am sad today, it's after the holidays, you know, my boss didn't treat me very nice, I had a fight with my spouse, or maybe I'm truly depressed. I really don't know. So I'm going to do a search on Google for depression. I'm going to start reading about it to find out whether or not I need to go to the doctor. I would do that because I know that the information is private. If the school is monitoring my communications as a student, if I suspect that the network engineers in the university are reading my searches, maybe I will not look for that. And instead, it may be too late and I may commit suicide because I left that completely unchecked and untreated. So some schools have been monitoring what the students are doing. And well, there can be rules. And it's clear that it could be rules. You can have a rule that says, listen, in this university, because of our values, students are not supposed to go to mature sex websites. We don't want them to use the internet on campus to do that. That's perfectly fine. You tell the students, you block those sites and everything else. But most schools have no rights to follow what the students are doing because that would violate the students' privacy. And in some countries, including Spain and the United States, that could be prosecuted by some of the authorities. So these are some of the fallacies, the wrong logic when it comes to uh, privacy. And this comes from some of the corporate tycoons on the internet. So Google's Eric Smith was the chief executive officer for Google, who said, if you have something that you don't want anyone to know, maybe you shouldn't be doing it in the first place. Not true. Like every problem, like every logical statement that is flawed, find an exception, and you'll find that the statement is flawed. And the example I used before about finding out whether or not you have a depression is a good example. You don't want anybody to find out. But there are many other things. You know, as human beings, we need a certain privacy and a space to explore new things. You know, you may be interested in taking ballet classes. Now, this is not very normal in a man of 45 years old, but maybe you're interested. Well, go take a look on the web without anybody finding out. You might even do, if you have seen the movie uh, Shall We Dance uh, with Richard Gere, the original was a Japanese movie, there was this businessman who wanted to dance, ballroom dance. And using the privacy of not being sure that nobody knew about it, he learned how to dance without telling anybody. It's a very sweet movie. Um, Scott McNeely, chief executive officer of Sun Microsystems, one of the internet giants, now a company owned by Oracle Corporation, said, privacy is dead, deal with it. You have zero privacy anyway. These statements are sometimes made by these technology companies to diminish the value of privacy. Because that way, when they do something wrong and they get caught doing something wrong, and they have, they get less of a slap in the hand. But I think that it's up to us, not only to protect the privacy of our students, but also to communicate to students that their privacy is important. And they also have a professional responsibility once they graduate to protect the privacy of the people they work with. If they're going to be technologists, they have to protect the information of the people on which information they work. If they're going to be doctors or psychologists, they have to protect the confidentiality of their patients. If they are going to be lawyers, they have to protect the information of their clients. We all have the responsibility of protecting some information. And we need to te teach the students that responsibility. And there are two ways to teach things. One of them is by telling people something, and the other one is by leading, by example. And if we don't do a good job in the universities, like we don't do in the United States, like we lose the data of the students, what kind of message are we sending to our students? When we send them a letter once every year, or once every two years, saying, oops, we're sorry. We lost your social security number, your, 
you don't sign you up for identity fraud protection because you could be the subject of fraud and we apologize. And once you get a letter like this, every two years you start beginning to think maybe you apologize but you're not serious about fixing this particular problem. I want you to um, look at this video when you have a chance. The person, uh, the video is called Tracking the Online Trackers and the person is Gary Kovacs. Take a look, it's a TED talk. You'd be surprised and what some of the technology companies are, how they're tracking you whenever you go on the internet, even unbeknownst to you. You may think that just because you don't sign up in your computer uh, to use uh, Gmail, that they're not tracking you. You'll be surprised. There's a way to collect information about all of us that is absolutely um, mind-boggling and worrisome. In, uh, Higher education, we're also very concerned about intellectual property. And we're concerned about two approaches to intellectual property. One approach is we don't want anybody to steal our intellectual property. We're faculty members, we produce intellectual property. It's been hard to write those articles, to develop those models. We don't want anybody to use them without us gaining something, either recognition or, or money or fees or anything like that. But we should also be concerned about not violating others' intellectual property. Now, as professors, we're very well trained. We merely recognize that something may be copyrighted or everything else, but students are not that good at this. So, let me give you an example. Joel Tannenbaum, a graduate student, was studying physics at Boston University. And he down downloaded 25 songs from the internet. Music, 25. So he was approached by the uh, Recording Industry Association of America, an association that, um, in which all of the recording labels work together. And he was told, listen, you downloaded 25 um, songs illegally. What do you have to say for yourself? Yes, I did. Well, we want you to pay a fine. We want you to pay $10,000. I'm a student. I don't have money. I don't want to pay. We're going to take you to trial. I'm not going to pay. They took him to trial. Now, because the case was notorious, he got one Harvard law professor to volunteer to defend him, one of the best in the copyright business. So they <coughs> went to trial. What do you think happened? He lost. He has asked to pay $675,000. Not Colombian pesos, which is expensive, <laughs> no, U.S. dollars. Now, the case continued, and uh, <coughs> the judge said, this is too much. Let me drop one zero, 67,500. Then the recording companies came back and reinstated the original fine, 675,000. It continues in litigation. But once again, this is the lesson learned. We have to tell our students in every field, you must protect the intellectual property of others. Because if you don't, you could get into legal trouble. You could get your organization into legal trouble. Let me give you an example. At Georgetown University, we develop a system for online course evaluations. At the end of the course, we send links to the students and we tell them what do you think about the course, the professor, and everything else. And we made them anonymous, completely anonymous, because we wanted students to freely express their opinions about anything. But something happened. We had a scale of one to five. One being this professor is horrible, five being this professor is the best ever. And every now and then, we had students who wrote back to us and said, listen, I got the survey and I marked everything as one horrible, when in reality I meant five. I thought that he was a great professor. Is there any way for me to correct this? I go, sorry, they're anonymous, there's no way. So we were thinking about how to fix the problem. And I talked to my team members, and I said, well, couldn't we use something graphical? In addition to the scale, we use like a, like a face, you know? You get a very red face with an angry expression for the one, and you get a very happy face, you know, with a yellow color for universal, you know, like the shirts and everything. Oh, great idea. So I tasked my programmers with modifying the system to do this, and they make it happen. And it looks great. And then I go, listen, where do you get the icons from? Where do you get the faces from? I go, oh, I downloaded them from the internet. 
from where on the internet? Oh, I just found them in another application. I go, no, 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 no. See, we can't be violating the interlocal property of others. Well, nobody's going to find out. This is behind a password, and uh, it's very unlikely that they do. But if they find it, it is embarrassing. And on top of that, it's wrong. So don't do it. Go online, find icons that you can buy, even if they're not as good, they're for sale, and we'll happily pay $200, $300 for the icons, and we'll use them. This comes from a knowledgeable professional in a university setting in the United States who works for a privacy and intellectual property expert, and I tell my team members what to do, and yet we run into this problem. So consider the importance of telling the students how important it is to protect intellectual property. And they don't think that it's, it's, it's important. I was teaching innovation in Mexico on Saturday, and the same way I gave you a list of books yesterday about innovation that I like, and I just gave you the list, I gave them the list. By the second day of class, they had downloaded illegal copies of all the books. I go, guys, you can't do this. At least not to me. I teach ethics. Not here, but I teach ethics somewhere else. So listen, if you're going to use the book, you buy the book. Don't use 10. Choose one and buy the one you're going to do. And if you want to do it better, maybe get them through the library of the school, and you can borrow them. Or between all of you in class, you can buy one copy each, and you share the books. But you can't be doing this. You're professionals. You have to respect intellectual property. What would happen if people were to install your algorithms, your software, and your systems without any compensation? You know, you have to lead by example. So there are four ways in which we protect intellectual property in the United States. One of them is copyright, you know, books, songs, music. The other one are patents. And patent litigation is a very complicated issue. I don't wish anybody to be involved in patent litigation. Then there are trademarks where you protect brand names and things like that. And the last one are trade secrets. The example would be, for example, the formula for Coca-Cola. The way you protect it is by having very few people know about it. Now, the other thing we need to teach students, and it's something that I do often, is I tell them, listen, when you come up with a good idea, you should know a little bit about intellectual property enough to have a conversation with a lawyer because the idea you have may be worthwhile for you. So I want you to consider, can I protect this with a copyright or should I try to get a patent for my idea? And I have encouraged some of my students to get patents. One of my students have a very interesting patent. He came up with the idea, he's from Panama, um, you know, of a certain age already, and he had a problem when changing the keyboard from English to Spanish. And he just said, well, listen, when I'm changing the keyboard and the software, I can't tell what keys I'm pressing, where the enye is or the accents or things like that. So he came up with the idea of a keyboard that has no letters. And electronically, depending on the keyboard you select, the letters illuminate with the right symbol. Wonderful idea. He has patented that. Now he's in discussions with some of the technology companies to see if he can license that. That was the advice. And he took my, intellectual, uh, my uh, ethics class, learned about intellectual property, and said, listen, this is a good idea. I'm going to patent it. And I told him, you know, if you make money, please make me a member of your advisory board and give me some money, too, because I help you here. So. <laughs> right. And also, information security is important. All of our students are going to be uh, managing information. The same way we manage information about them, they're going to be managing information about clients, partners, everybody else. We need to teach them how to be careful with that information. And it's very difficult because the bad guys are out there. You know, there's virus software, malware, that is meant to spy on the computer. Some of that comes from Russia. Some of that comes from the NSA or the CIA. There are hackers and cyber criminals. Uh, there are employees who are unhappy and they leak the information to competitors. And sometimes there are even students who may be uh, cause an information security threat. My friend. My dear friend from Santa Clara University had an incident by which a group of students were hacking into the student information system. And they started by changing their own grades. But then they went on. And they started changing other students' grades. Sometimes for the better, for money. Sometimes for the worse, because they hated those students. So what happens? In the United States, this is a federal crime against the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act. So the FBI is investigating. The students have been prosecuted. Uh, the legal proceedings have not finished, but I would be surprised if they don't end up serving some jail time. 
and jail time, among other things, because the FBI and the prosecutors want to send an example to students everywhere saying this is not, this is not acceptable. Even if you find a technical way to circumvent the security of the system, if you do this, we're going to try to prosecute you. So this is what I would argue, that we need to teach the students how to be careful with information security. You know, I had, for example, last year I took a job in Connecticut, and we had a clinic uh, on um, speech disorders, speech therapy for people who cannot talk very well. You know, they had maybe, um, you know, it could be an aneurysm uh, or something, some other uh, a stroke, some other problem, and they had to relearn how to speak. And these people had on a USB drive the list of all the patients. Little drive, you know, like the one I have connected here. And guess what? They lost the drive. So there you are, all the information about patients in a drive that you have no idea what it is. So according to the laws of the state of Connecticut, you have to find all those people, you have to notify them that the information has been lost, and you have to notify them that maybe they may be subject to identity theft. Embarrassing, expensive. How could you be a doctor, a professional, and not know that there is a better way to keep track of the uh, patient information? So if these are the faculty who are teaching the students, what do you think the students are learning when they get the information? They're perpetuating the problem. So it's not so hard to explain to the students and to lead by example by telling them, if you put confidential information in a USB drive, encrypt it. There's encryption. It costs $20 to have a drive with encryption versus a drive without encryption. Get the one with encryption. If you don't even want to pay the $20, you can download the software from the internet and put the encryption yourself. That way, if you lose the drive and it's encrypted, you don't have to worry about it. And anybody can lose a laptop or a drive. You know, I was on the way to Las Vegas to give a speech on privacy and security. And I reached midway through the flight from Washington to Las Vegas. I reached into the compartment to get my laptop. And I started looking, I go, where is my laptop? I go, oh, I know. I left it plugged in at the airport in the outlet. I was charging the airport before the, the, the laptop before the flight and I forgot it. Gee, not good. So what happened? First, I didn't have to worry because I had no confidential information there. Everything I had was encrypted. So I didn't have to notify anybody. Second, I called the security people at the airport and somebody had turned in the laptop. So on my way back I was able to get the laptop. So that's very nice. That doesn't happen all the time. But we've seen these cases at the Veterans Administration, you know, where the people who went to war in the United States and came back, at the Veterans Administration, they lost millions of records. The tax authority in North Carolina have lost millions of records. And this comes partially because the professionals who use these systems are not thinking. There's no way to create a technology system that is usable and cannot be exploited. It's simply impossible. So we need the human element in the middle. We need professional people who are using technology in such a way that they're not going to expose the information. And this is something we need to teach all of our students. Our schools have a mission of service, and this is why we might use technology for that service. So for example, uh, this is a um, cartoon, a Venn diagram, and this compares two things. The things on the front page of a university, on the website, and the things that people are trying to look on the website. And if you look at most of them in the United States, you find that what we put in the website, we put photos, we put things of the alumni, we put things like that. And what people are looking for are all the things that are useful to them. And only in the middle, the only thing where we coincide is the full name of the school. I'm saying we've got to use technology better, oftentimes. And if there are things that the school is producing that are good for the general public, consider putting them out there using the technology. But if there are things that should not be distributed, Make sure they're not distributed. I've seen cases of faculty members who take a list of names for a class with the grades and they post that on the internet. Yeah, yeah, that's the reaction. Who has the right to know that Pepe Martinez Gonzalez did not do well in a math exam? Nobody, only Pepe Martinez Gonzalez and the school administrators, nobody else. And the faculty member thought, well, listen, it was just because I thought it would be useful for them to get it online. Well, they can get it online in different ways. Consult with the administrators about the best way. 
more often than not, it's not out of malice. It's just out of not knowing. And if the faculty members don't know, imagine how we're preparing the students uh, when they join the profession. Uh, there are many other things that are going to have an impact on what we do and uh, things that are important for our students to be aware of. So, for example, all the matters of internet governance, how the internet works. You know, the digital divide is very important to consider who has access to the internet and who hasn't. More often than not, when we think about putting things online, we think about people like us, people who are educated, people who have technology, people who know how to use the technology. Now, every time I develop new systems in the universities where I've served, I always think about people who are not in that category. For example, many of the people who work in the janitorial service, in the cafeteria or cleaning the university, many of them are from El Salvador in Washington, D.C. And many of them do not speak English very well. And many of them do not have access to a computer. So whenever we put these systems, for example, so that every time you get your paycheck, you can get it online, I have to come up with a solution by which those people can get it online. So once again, we need to uh, make sure that our students think that for any public service they have, particularly if they work in government, that they're considered not the haves in technology, but also the have nots. And they're thinking about not leaving them behind. Something else that many people don't think about when it comes to technology, we all can see more or less with our glasses. There are a lot of people who cannot see. And these people also need to use the technology and the internet. And I used to do a tour in the United States where, uh, that I did with a blind student from my school. And with the students, we showed people the difference when you look at a website that had been designed for blind people versus a website that had not been designed for blind people. Can I tell you something? To you and me, they looked identical, two sites, because they looked the same to us. But the way you build the site behind the scenes, the way you put labels, the way you structure the site, with just a slightly more work, not significantly, made a whole world of difference to a blind person. The blind person could use a specialized software, and the software could bypass all the pictures, all the nice fonts, all the things like that, and read only the relevant information so they could navigate. And that only took a little bit more effort. So these are things that we need to tell our students as we're thinking about how they're going to work with people with disabilities or people who are not um, as privileged as we are. So what could go wrong then with all these technologies? I think I mentioned some of them. They're the privacy uh, violations. And another example of privacy violations, in Pennsylvania, a high school was uh, giving laptops to students. This is very common. Some schools give laptops, some schools give uh, tablets. And they were giving laptops to a student. And then it occurred to them that they could use the laptops to activate the webcams while the students were at home and find out what the students were doing. Yes. Yes. What were you thinking? And they were thinking, well, we think that some students are smoking drugs, so maybe we can find out with the cameras. I am sorry. This is not a good idea. And precisely, this is what happened. They accused one of the students. The whole way in which they found out uh, was uncovered. And there were not only a big media scandal, but most importantly, there were lawsuits. Because there's an expectation of privacy. And not only that, but think about it. You're spying the students in the rooms. Some of them are teenagers. Some of them are doing things that you don't want to know what they're doing. And they have the right to do in private, at that age in particular. So. It could also happen with this, that there is discrimination and unfair treatment. If the information leaks, for example, that I was expelled twice from Northern Virginia Community College, I may apply for a scholarship from the Ford Foundation or Fulbright or somebody else, and then they say, eh, Pablo looks good, but we just came out with this notice that he was expelled from my community college. Let's go to the next candidate. And you know the problem? The problem is that I would never find out about that. I would be disqualified from the process, and nobody would tell me, Pablo, it's because of your record at the North Virginia Community College. So that is why we need transparency, and this is why we need to protect the privacy of the students. Imagine, for example, there's only one country in the world right now where you cannot make employment decisions. Uh, actually, two countries in the world where you cannot make employment decisions based on your Google searches. 
One of them is Germany. By law, you cannot do that. You apply to a job, your name is Pablo Molina, you apply for a job, and um, let's say as technologist for a BMW in Germany. And they look up Pablo Molina on the internet. And they find three. They find the one who teaches at Georgetown, they find another one who teaches at Stanford University, a brilliant computer scientist, and they find another one who's a black gentleman who's a reggae singer in Buenos Aires. And they look at that and say, we don't hire reggae singers here, so you're out of the job. They cannot do that in Germany. They can only find the verifiable information that I have provided. In the United States, it's the same way. You cannot make financial decisions based on unverified information. This is why there's a credit history and the credit reports and carry bureaus that report this information. And because employment is considered financial information, if they do an employment decision, based on what they found on the internet, and they admit that, you could sue them. Now guess what? How many people do you think do this all the time? Everybody. Have you ever Googled anybody before you met them in person? Yeah. I'm going to think you're going to meet them in a cafeteria or an airport and you want to see what they look like, or you want to learn a little bit about them. So imagine if the information is incorrect. Very recently in Europe, there was a case brought up by the Spanish Data Protection Agency by Google is the right to be forgotten. There was a person in Spain whose uh, property was taken because he was not making payments. Eventually he addressed the situation, but every time you search for his name in Google, that page would come up, which by the way was correct at the time. He was in financial problems. So he petitioned the agency to have it removed by Google. Google said no, the agency took it to the European Commission, to the highest court in the European Union, and the high school said, yes, there is a right to be forgotten on the internet, and Google has to remove that information. That's important. Problems, for example, as I mentioned before, all the intellectual property ones, all the problem with plagiarism and anti-plagiarism services. This is very concerning, because those of you, or those of us who use, I don't use them personally, but my university uses anti-plagiarism services, turn it in, safe assign, and many others. The problem is the false positives, the problem is the false negatives, and the problem also is that once you submit a paper, they keep the paper in order to compare that paper against other papers. So it creates a problem with intellectual property. Also it creates many problems because it is true that students in many places cheat. They know about El Rincón del Vago and they know about many other resources in order to cheat. But the problem is this. If you cannot trust them to be professionals, to do the right thing when they're in the school, if you have to submit their work to anti-plagiarism uh, software when they're in the school, what do you have to do when they join the profession? You know, when they're lawyers and they write a document, are you gonna run it by an anti-plagiarism software to make sure they didn't copy from a colleague? When they do a proposal for a technology company, are you gonna do the same? You're gonna find out they didn't copy or cheat or anything like that? I mean, these technologies um, are a double-edged sword. They can be useful. I'm much more in favor of using these services uh, as a self-service tool that says, listen, I want you to use it on your own and make sure that you don't um, plagiarize, that you're according everything correctly. And the last thing that is very interesting, something very scandalous. How many of you heard of the Harvard experiments with cameras this year? Embarrassing. A friend of mine, Harry Lewis, who also serves on the Electronic Privacy Information Center, who has been just renamed Dean of the Harvard um, School of Art and Sciences, addressed the scandal. What happened there is the following. They were trying to find out whether students go to class or not. That was the purpose of the study. So because they have cameras in some rooms, they activated them and they started taking pictures of all the rooms and tried to find out how many students were in the classes. But because of face recognition and other things, you can actually tell what students are in class, what students are not in class. And the problem is this, we've learned this the hard way with the Tuskegee experience. You cannot experiment on human subjects without their consent. And they were experimenting on the Harvard students without their consent. So once this became public, there was a big scandal, a big black eye for Harvard University. And this is what my friend wrote, but none of us students or faculty want to be treated like inmates of some academic panopticon. The panopticon was a prison uh, described by Foucault 
in one of his books by which there was a big tower and all the prisoners were being observed constantly, 24 by 7. They had zero privacy, and that drove them crazy. Never knowing for sure whether they were being or have been under scrutiny while we were going about our daily business of teaching and learning. So you can do these experiments. We know this, for example, from the Tuskegee experiments in the United States. In the Tuskegee experiments, they, they wanted to find out what were the long term of syphilis on people when untreated. So they took a group of poor black people and they told them, we're going to treat you for syphilis. And you know what? They didn't. They gave them placebos and they let them degrade and get worse and worse and worse and find out what syphilis would, would do to their nervous system. And many of them died and died horrible deaths. That was completely unacceptable. You can't experiment on people. And I hope that we don't experiment on people as we get data from the learning management systems, from the adaptive systems, for all the technologies that we make available, that we're very careful about the privacy uh, guidelines, and we're very careful about how we use that information. And when in doubt, consult with your colleagues in the philosophy department and the ethics colleagues and your, and your lawyers. So what's the good here? That all these technologies can help the students learn better. And this is very important also for people with disabilities or people who need a special courses because this information can help them do better. And this is also very important for many of us because it's no longer the case that we went to school and that was the end of our schooling. Now it's clear that we're lifelong learners. We're going to continue learning through massive online open courses, seminars, TED Talks, conferences. We're going to learn things in our profession. We're also going to learn how to do salsa dancing, flamenco, or scuba diving, or first aid. And all of those, we want them to be protected. We just want that information to be there when we need it. Who are the bad people? We are the bad people sometimes. If we don't do our jobs as technologists, professors, and students, we are the bad people. But even worse, certainly, are the executives who are just too greedy, and they're just trying to profit from information they shouldn't profit. And certainly the ugly are just the bad people, the criminals who are stealing the information for identity theft, as well as the hackers which is trying to damage the systems. So this slide is right there, but basically I'm summarizing with a little bit of a speech uh, what I think is the gist of this, that we have to lead by example when we use technology morally and ethically and legally in higher education and also that by using that and leading by example, we're going to teach the students how to do the same in their professions. And this is one more critical skill. One of the advantages of students who go to Georgetown University, because it's one of the few Jesuit and religious universities in Washington, D.C., is that the students can claim, listen, I went to a program at Georgetown and I had to take an ethics class, which is not a requirement in other, course, in other programs. So at the very least, I've been exposed to the ethical <coughs> concepts of intellectual property, professional responsibility, fairness, transparency. Now, that doesn't make you a, a better person. If you're a bad person, you can enroll at Georgetown and get your degree. But at the very least, now you know for sure you're a bad person. Uh, but this is a competitive advantage for some of the students that are hired by the corporations because they assume that there's a higher standard of professional responsibility. And I would argue that a university like the one in La Sabana, because of your historic connections and because of some of the ethical components of your programs, you have the ability also to uh, project this, to train students with these skills, and also to promote your brand name as very uh, students with integrity and sincerity who really understand uh, the tenets of the profession. And with that, um, I'd like to open the floor for any questions. Or not. In English or Spanish? <laughs> yes? I have a question that's a very particular case, I think, in speaking to the application of this algorithm. I have a lot of music downloaded onto my phone, illegally downloaded. And I recently took a trip to Europe. I was in France, Switzerland, and Spain, and all of my music was here. Is there something in the EU that makes that happen, or is it just coincidence? It is coincidence. Yeah, no, 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 no. Because, think about it carefully. That would even be illegal. For the governments or the record companies or the technology companies, being an Apple and an Android device, for them to go into your devices and remove information, even illegal, without your permission, 
uh, that would be illegal, contrary to the law. So what happened, maybe it was upgraded, maybe you changed your username, uh, maybe uh, when you were sleeping, a mortal angel came, angel came and deleted your music. No, I have no idea. So, but thank you for admitting. I, I hope you're not recording this because, <laughs> and with the art, don't, don't disclose your name. So. <laughs> Um, you know, there are many. There are many resources. And for example, I've seen a public service announcements, video campaigns by the government of Uruguay and the government of Spain to precisely address to what seems like a primary and secondary school um, kids. Uh, and those are terrific resources. Um, I can share some of those if you send me an email. Um, the idea is that you can reinvent the wheel because a teacher probably doesn't even know all the ways in which Facebook can be used. Uh, but lucky for us, many people have addressed uh, this particular problem and continue to address it. Uh, and there is help in the horizon. I would argue that in the past, we've taught uh, children to be civilized. Now, part of that uh, education came from home, and that was the important one, the values we got from our parents. In some countries where uh, there is a religious tradition, like Colombia or Spain, it was also learned in church or a Sunday school or things like that. But I would argue that, once again, also in primary, secondary, and tertiary education, we have a responsibility to teach students how to use technology well. And one of the ways in which they use it well is by not using them to do things online that they would not do in person. And most of them would not do certain things in person that they do online, so. Yes? How Georgetown is some policy Uh, we do. We sign up for uh, a service called edX, which was originally created by MIT, MIT and Harvard. And the policy that we have right there is to make at least one MOOC available. And we have just made a MOOC, Massive Online Open Course on Bioethics, available to the world. Were you no, 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 no. This is just one course. One course for the entire university. What you're asking for, for example, the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, came up with a program that said all of your course materials are going to be made available to the public. And they made it available through a, pla through a platform called the Open Courseware. That is a remarkable development. And Georgetown did not want to do this. In fact, I proposed that we do this to some of the schools. And they look at me saying, Pablo, you're crazy. We'll never give away our intellectual property. So different approaches right there. Now, to tell you the truth, MIT put their content on the open courseware, and the content is being used by kids in China, Colombia, Spain, India, engineers, because they get great resources there from the teachers. It's not an MIT education, but all the teaching materials. And MIT is getting three things out of this. One, a lot of goodwill. The world thinks that they're a great institution. Second, lots of publicity. There's no kid now in all of those countries who doesn't want to be an MIT engineer. And the third one, they also get a multi-million dollar grant from a foundation that paid for everything. So there are many reasons why people do different things. And I'm not sure that you should give away your intellectual property, always, just for the benefit of the world. MIT decided to do it. Georgetown has done it with one course. Many are doing it with the MOOCs. Sometimes you want to protect your intellectual property. Because if you give away all of your resources in your master's in education and technology, there could be a competing university in Medellin or in Venezuela who takes all of your content and say, listen, we give an education as good as Universidad de La Sabana for one third the price. Did I answer your question? Yes. All right. Any other questions? How is the copyright? Different from the trademark or a patent? Uh -huh. All right. um, good question. A patent um, is used only um, to protect a useful invention. It has to be, for example, a medication, Viagra. 
that is something useful for some people anyway, and they give you a patent for the exclusive rights to produce that particular medication for a number of years, usually 20 years. And after 20 years, the patent expires, and anybody can produce a version of Viagra or something else. The patent also comes, for example, from um, the way a catalytic engine works. Or a patent could be uh, something as simple as, uh, um, you know, how you um, display, how you, um, how a little cart in the supermarket works. If it's got five wheels instead of four, you can have a patent for that. Copyright is used to produ produ produce something that you write or perform. It doesn't have to have any utility. Patent, it has to be useful. Copyright, they don't have to be useful. Uh, a book is copyrighted, a song is copyrighted, a play is copyrighted. Some of them are trickier. For example, a database, you can copyright a database because you take information, let's say the phone numbers of people in Bogota. If I organize that in a unique way that has never been organized like that before, then I can copyright that organization of the phone numbers, even though the phone numbers are public. And the trademarks are different. The trademarks is when you register the name of your company. If your company is called Technology Is Us, you register that. No other companies can be called Technology Is Us because it could be confusing. Sometimes you can copyright a trademark that is more evolved like that, like a big logo and company name or things like that. If you remember the movies by the Metro Golden Mayor, there's a big lion at the beginning. That whole scene with the lion roaring, and the, that is a trademark. And nobody can issue something that looks like that that could confuse people to think that the movie has been produced by Metro Goldwyn Mayer. So if you want to create a company called Metro Colombian Mayer that makes movies and it's got a lion that looks like that, then you'll probably be sued and say you're induced into confusion here. Thank you. Are there any questions? Me and for your questions. Every time somebody asks I want to thank you for that.